first item on our agenda are public comments. To the best of my knowledge, we have no one signed up for public comments. Is that accurate? signs up and uh, start to see some signs come up now for the, for the anticipation of commencement uh, this weekend. Another reminder is on June 5th uh, from noon to about 5 we have uh, the Casa Pacifica Wine Festival and that will also if you participate in over 1,500 to 1,500 to 3,000 folks that will attend that. Um, as you, as everybody certainly knows that that, that we all have music playing that is, you know, that echoes up at the university and the community but uh, they should have that all uh, uh, wrapped up by about five o'clock, and uh, hopefully all the Uber drivers have all the intoxicated people uh, <laughs> to where they need to get to without incident. So, um, another reminder for folks: I don't know if you got this or not, but uh, you were, uh, between May 23rd and May 25th, uh, University Drive will be closed. They're going to be doing some uh, painting, some slurry, uh, slurry, I should say, and then some striping uh, during that time. So that that, that will, will, be, will be impacted. And then also uh, that same roadway between June 1st and June 2nd. So they're going to pave and slurry uh, late May, and then, uh, like I said, June 1st and 2nd, they'll be disrupting striking that. Um, last report, uh, just for those that may be interested in listening, uh, we're working, uh, we have a good meeting today. We're discussing a, uh, uh, a, a safety fair. Uh, we haven't mailed out some dates yet, but uh, working with Jake and Mission Hills to uh, provide a uh, community safety fair that will discuss fire safety and fire mitigation and uh, emergency management evacuations and evacuations and just general emergency management stuff. We haven't mailed out today, so we've got we're in the idea mode right now, and uh, we'll be able to the university game the university game community in combination with the, with, uh, the uh, campus community. So we're looking forward to that. And we'll have more information to follow. And that's all I have. Any safety. questions? Yeah, Chief, uh, the three incidents that you reported, uh, were those residents or were they drive-ins? Uh, Sarge, can you kind of help me on that? Uh, so I know, I, I believe one reported by Pink So the, the subject, the rest of the outstanding warrants was not a resident. Not a resident. That was not a resident. Um, and as far as the two, ju two juveniles that were seen uh, taking the, the signs, we we didn't have information that they were residents. Um, as far as the, the intoxicated subject, I believe, um, I believe that that's a uh, resident. Yeah. So the, 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 the first person, uh, the first incident, um, do, do you know why they were here? Were they um, I, I think they're they're in a relationship with a resident. Okay, yeah. got it. There you go. Um, two more questions. Sure. Yeah. So you mentioned Casa Pacifica. This is a really dumb question. 
Is Casa Pacifica within your jurisdiction? Well, it's, uh, I mean, within, I mean, it's used a mile, I mean, uh, officially our jurisdiction, yeah. because our jurisdiction as university police officers is one mile right. from any, any of the border that across the Pacific, it sits, uh, sits within that. But uh, that's for our patrol, for, for, for our call for service response, that's, that would still be uh, county okay. response, yes. Great, I never really thought about it. And then, uh, the final thing, safety day, uh, safety in the community could include more than policing type services. For example, fire. Uh, uh, is there a chance uh, we could get get um, so we county have fire, this, state fire to get so, involved? So in we this. had this really broad for this conversation we had this session today in Zoka, which is a very, very expansive view of what a safety fair should cover, including okay. looking at fire and related things. And thanks to John's suggestion, it may become our first really large combined event. University Glen and the university doing something together. Um, and I, and I, think, that, and I think that's a really exciting, exciting opportunity to finally look at okay. so, town and gown working together to do something. So my focus was specifically on the fire part, so uh, it might be helpful if County Fire or whoever it is uh, could talk about some practical safe fire yeah. safety issues. I mean, we have um, open fire with fire pits that people use. Is that, is that okay? Just suggestions on things like that. So there, there will be a fire department piece to this. Okay. Okay. That's, that's going to be part of it. Great. Yeah, and thank you for your suggestion. We will, uh, yeah, we talked about that already. But, we'll but I will make sure you give the OSU questions before the next time. <laughs> I have a question for me. How are you, sir? Uh, quick question. I believe you are setting up an EOC. We're setting up a, for the uh, for the commencement. Not uh, emergency center, communication center. I believe there's some repeaters coming up and things like that. Can you elaborate on that? Are you talking in reference to the commencement? Uh, not only commencement, o overall from a radio communication perspective. Yeah, we're actually we're looking at our complete uh, uh, on-campus radio system now. We're improving our radio console. Hopefully to have that installed by June. But as part of that overall radio communication plan, mm -hmm. uh, it it's kind of involves four pieces. Our radio console, our repeaters, as you're referring to up on the hill, mm -hmm. and, uh, and having uh, uh, that reevaluated. We already had it reevaluated, but we want to have... Uh, there's, a, there's what they call a microwave piece that's associated mm -hmm. with that as well. So we're looking at what's going to be better options for us right now. We have a vendor that's, that's due to come back out and do a wider assessment on that piece of it. Mm -hmm. And then the last piece is uh, improving our officers' handheld radios so that you know we have the most up-to-date equipment. How, how integrated are you with the OES and the Ventura EOC? Well, our, our main connection there, which I've shared with you before, is uh, with uh, the county EOC as our liaison emergency manager, Maggie Tupas. Okay. Uh, our radios, our handheld radios will connect with county, so we, we have those capabilities. Uh, once we improve our our, uh, uh, our repeater system, we'll have even a wider range. That's, that's our hopes. So my next question would be, what kind of radio communication network do you have within the community in case of emergency? Right, in terms of radios? Yeah, radio communication with the homeowners, who are licensed to operate within the OEC? Yeah, we don't. We, we, I don't believe we have anything at this point, unless you, are, you know. I know the, the No, I'm just asking. Yeah. Do you have plans to do that? Uh, certainly, we will entertain any plan for that. That's uh, if that's something that, that you and I could perhaps get on a side conversation and see how that would work. We do like a, with our building marshals on campus. I so believe there is some do. going on with the Mr. Jason Miller. With J yes, so our, the ham radio. That's another piece that that we're working. We're also working with him. Uh, because he's part of the ham operator club mm -hmm. and uh, well like for example for commencement they're going to be you know using a practice session mm -hmm. uh, and, and uh, using our site up there to help with their ham radio communications for that as practice so, so that may be something that we could look at yeah and how would that impact our uglen i don't know yet we'd have to look at it and have a deeper conversation about that at, at this point but we're welcome to have that conversation okay sure. so. and okay we can talk about it. Do we have a population of ham people in the neighborhood? I, ham uh, licensed folks? It's, 
funny you guys mentioned it, this, just mentioned the ham radio operators. I don't know, Jason Miller is, uh, who is a uh, professor on campus. Um, he is, is part of a club, a ham operators club, and we're just getting off the ground to start working with them. Uh, I don't know all the capabilities at this point. We're at ground zero on this thing, but uh, we certainly, from public safety, want to work with him. We know there's some value to having ham operators. We've got the emergency across the nation have proven that. Well, my, my father used to be the emergency coordinator for Riverside County, and he ended up in that what would they volunteer job right. because he was a ham operator, and he brought that whole communications network back in the day. Yeah, and so, we want that out of the interest to see who has interest here in the university going community. It's uh, it's an but there's a lot of value to those folks. It, and I guess one of our real issues in our in our canyon is that our cell coverage is so spotty. Absolutely, yeah. And I, I would hope that community-wide we would look at, from an emergency perspective, how we can do that so that what people are, what everyone is carrying with them also integrates into what they're doing. Yes, that's where they are. You know, and, and part of our reassessment for our repeaters is we know that we're going to be expanding into that new, new wind, new phase, getting a new one to show our coverage. It's going to be a same back Well, I'm glad you're thinking about it, and I also think it's, and I'm sorry that our public folks aren't joining us this evening, but it was an issue that was on my list to bring up with them tonight, yeah. was to look at what could we do to expand cell coverage in, in our cell desert <laughs> that we have in the canyon. Exactly, exactly. Because I think that's going to have to end up being a public-private partnership in some way. Thank you. I have one more question I have. Karen. Um, what are plans for uh, building a, what we call it as, you know, sort of a community um, watch group? You know, you have what is this called? Neighborhood. Neighborhood watch group. Do you have any plans to do that for our community once the 600 homes comes through? No, but that's, uh, again, we're, you know, we're always looking for because that's part of you could get it as a Sisaki, I mean Channel Island uh, grant, possibly. Well, I have to look at that. I mean, it's something that we're interested in. Obviously, we're going to have an increased population up there. We don't know what the numbers would be, but it's mm -hmm. two thousand. You know, because that would automatically link with some of the emergency management. Yeah, that's a, that's a good possibility. We're inter we'll entertain that for sure. That's a that's a good idea. You know, we're all communities, a lot of communities, have to really watch. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's time for us to consider it. You know, uh, okay. It takes community buy-in, you know, and then... Uh, I mean, I think we have I'm just a thought process here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, good thoughts. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thank you. Right here? Yeah. Good evening. Uh, Scott Godfrey, right here from Mexico Services. Um, so this evening, just give you some, some real brief updates as to what we have going on, but uh, mainly the overall focus that we've had, just as landscapers, has been water management. That's the thing that we've been really focusing on, trying to understand um, the current regulations and how that's going to impact landscape overall. Um, a couple things I can tell you is, just as of this week, Camarosa does not have any current restrictions in place. Uh, they do have a board meeting coming up on the 26th, so that is an open forum for anybody that would like to attend, but Camarosa will, at that board of directors meeting, will be rolling out their mandates, um, so they can anticipate that. Uh, some other notes is just, just to know that the community would be considered a commercial account, so there's a lot of people talking about residential water and residential restrictions, just mind, bear in mind that we are a commercial account for water usage. Um, is what, it, I'm sorry, is that for both fresh and Just fresh in fresh? general, under the state mandate, we are considered a commercial dam. Uh, the, the other things that really kind of came off that was they are following their SoCal water smart, uh, water smart rebates, so turf renovations, controller upgrades, which you guys should do with yeah, controller upgrades, but um, water efficient nozzles, high efficiency nozzles, so those are all opportunities to look into as we, we move forward. But that's the thing. Open the potential rebates or Absolutely. funding yeah. rebates. Absolutely. So that all follows the MWD, which 
from water district rebates. Uh, Cam Rosa himself does not, uh, does not administer any rebates, but they follow the MWE program. Um, I think it's SoCal Water Smart or something to that effect. It's pretty easy website if you want to find it. Uh, but some of the things, you know, like I said, truck removal, high efficiency nozzles, uh, things of those extent are all things that they are trying to go towards. Um, one of the things that also we want to make sure that we are committed to is as recently they have outlawed the usage of non pressure regulated sprinkler heads. So they're going to manufacture those anymore, or you can't buy them in California anymore. So anytime we're doing any sort of re, uh, sprinkler repairs or upgrades or anything, we are using the pressure regulating heads. So that's just a normal practice that we're doing as of recently. Uh, do you have them? In the non regulated uh, heads, pressure regulated heads, you can use them, but you can't buy them anywhere right now. So there's something to be aware of. Okay, I'm sorry, can I have some more? So, what does that mean to us? So, what does that mean? Do we have them right now? Not? So, most of your sprinkler heads right now, that's just the pop ups, the regular pop ups. They're yeah. non pressure regulated, yeah. and they don't have any check valves on them. Okay. And that's when that was the, whatever the issue was solved. But now, California mandate is every new sprinkler head has to be pressure regulated. So does that mean we'll be using less water? Theoretically, yes. Theoretically. Yeah. Okay. So what that does, the pressure regulating, it allows it, it eliminates or helps eliminate the loss of atmospheric pressure. You know, when your sprinkler head pops up and you kind of get that mist, mm -hmm. the pressure regulating helps to regulate that or minimize that mist. So you don't lose as much water through that. Yeah. How much will the day cost in the old fashioned time? Quite a bit. <laughs> Just off the top of my head, uh, a typical sprinkler was costing anywhere from six to seven dollars. Now they're about thirteen. Okay. Uh, some of the what they call shrub heads, so they're the little risers that you put on top, and you put the sprinkler nozzle on top of those. Those just cost about fifty cents. They cost about three fifty. Yeah. yeah. So it's a pretty significant increase. Uh, but again, we're not doing any sort of wholesale. Just any time we make a repair, we're putting in the new product okay. as we move forward. Um, so just the general statewide mandates. So. Um, the state has rolled out some just general mandates, and most municipalities or water agencies are kind of adhering to that with their own twist to it. And again, it depends on reclaimed versus potable water, um, so that's kind of what we're waiting for Camarosa. But just in general, uh, they don't want any more than, than two days irrigating on any property, so two days per week irrigation. Uh, they want to limit the water window it's from 6 p.m. to 10 a.m. So don't water in the middle of the day. So that's another thing we need to be thoughtful of. Uh, currently, we're pretty much adhering to that schedule right now. Uh, working with Jay to make sure that we are because we've had some issues with phase two. But going in and making sure that we're using the hydromatic or weathermatic system to make sure that we're in compliance in the water window. So our current water window right now for turf is Tuesday 10 p.m. to Wednesday 6 uh, a.m. And then Saturday, 10 p.m. to Sunday, 6 a.m., that's for turf. And then for our shrubs, it's Wednesday, 10 p.m. to Thursday, 6 a.m. So keeping those on those specific days. Can I interrupt you for a second? Yeah, go for it. I looked at Jake and John. So we've had a discussion in the last couple of weeks about the university here, when we water, that airlock and all that. Have we got a solution? I mean, are we, have these yes. guys squared away now? Yes. Okay, we're good? Yes, yes. Because we, we, we got we worked together to get the uh, the timing correct, and now that um, the timing is correct on on Brightview's part, we are scheduled and it may have already happened to close the valve. It has closed between yeah. 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 Thank you. You're good. Yeah. I think there so is uh, a little bit of confusion on water on Tuesday. Okay. Well, Tuesday in this case actually started, or sorry, water on Thursday, Wednesday night. So we got everything working with Jay's yeah. so we got that started. Right. So the, yeah. when the university starts during the day, but we aren't, we aren't pulling water at the same time. We are gonna go through, we're gonna do, so Marcelo, our production manager, I will be doing the rest of the team, we'll be out here tomorrow just doing some, some inspection just to make sure that we haven't missed anything. Um, so just kind of thought forward thinking plans of action, just again, some recommendations is we want to make sure that we prioritize in high visibility areas. Um, we want to make sure that we are preserving heritage trees. Um, 
the effect of moving solid drip around some of these larger trees if we do have to do further reductions. So if those are the some of the recommendations, high visibility, heritage trees, we've got quite a few of them for the community. Uh, prioritize functional turf. So functional turf would be anything like the park, anything that people would use on a regular basis. Functional turf would not be parkway turf, so that might be something that we'd have to reduce. Parkway turf is just a strip between the street and the, the sidewalk, so they don't consider that functional turf. Um, and kind of lowest part of your really your hardy shrubs, where even kind of your 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 hedges, your raffulets, and stuff like that, if you work out tolerant plant material, they would be on the low priority and low priority turf um, if we do have to prioritize even further. So that's the mindset that we're going with um, if we should have to make further changes to the uh, irrigation system. What are you going to buy total area, square feet area also? Are you planning to look into the total surface area of high level and low level no, turf area? That's no. That's not necessarily something we could do. If it's something that, that makes sense, then we could, but we're prioritizing by, by type. By type. Yeah. Um, just the other big thing that we're working on in terms of the June 1st deadline for brush control, we've got uh, a lot of it knocked out, but would we try, because I think that's important, maybe one of my last times I was here, we want to start earlier on the brush control. So kind of starting down the ravine, some of that has, we've got some of the bigger stuff, but we've just seen some of the stuff that we've grown. So the team's gonna come through here and just re-knock down everything and make sure we're totally in compliance. We'll probably want to schedule some of the wearing, you know, make things happen. We can talk about that. We're gonna be tomorrow morning to go over that. So Jake, uh, yeah, Jake, I uh, mean tomorrow to make sure that we're in compliance and we're ready to go. Um, you will notice teams out here the next two weekends just to make sure that they're pushing out, but we won't start early. And make sure that have we determined, and I don't know to whom this question, whose property we're clearing? That is not in my head. That is not. We're, we are getting the... We are clearing what Larry Williams, Williams, Williams had told us to clear last That's year. That's what we are doing that again. Yes. Which means that Tom's pending question about what portion of that is really Newland's responsibility and what portion is the university's responsibility remains an open question. We can talk about it. Okay. So it's a pending issue? Pending issue. Pen, uh, pending clarification. Yeah, and it needs to be say. done, the question is who pays for a certain part of the council. Who pays? Yes, at the present time it is in the budget, where I use budget to do it. Um, speaking of pending items, we do have a list of a couple of pending work orders that we're going through, making sure we're checking those off, working with Jake and the team to make sure we're compliant with all pending work orders. Um, a couple of things, we noticed some plants that were struggling from phase one, the planting, so we want to make sure we get those replanted and replaced. It's not a huge amount, but we want to make sure we're thoughtful. Do you know roughly how many do have been reported? Oh, gosh, I think we did something like 60 plus. I don't remember off the top of my head. 60? Yeah. Recently? Specific? No, no, we're working on that. We're going, we haven't done it yet. Oh, but 60 have been reported recently. Yes. yes. Uh, you did, going we, back did a walk. we did a walk okay. and, and looked at them. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and that includes all of phase one, including um, the town site apartments, as well okay. as Anna Kappa and Lane and Cohen. Yep. Specifically focusing on the walk, I love the uh, purple plant. It's got a little purple flower on it. It's one of the ones that just yeah. seems to have struggled the most. So we want to make sure we put a, a replacement together. Do we know why it was why it struggled? Was it light or water or? Lower Thelum is a very temperamental plant to get started. And so if it doesn't have, it could be water in some cases, but it's usually very uh, shade tolerant. It's sun tolerant for the most part. So it's most likely water related, but it is a very temperamental plant to get started. Once you get it established, it's great. It's very drought tolerant, um, but again, kind of getting it started Um, so that's what we want to make sure that if we recommended it, we're making sure that we're getting it done. Um, other than that, that's my overall updates for what I have going on right now. Okay. Uh, All right. Probably just could be directed to you. So the irrigation specialist contract we have, the one year contract, mm -hmm. are we on track to finish that? Yep. Yes. I, let me go back and make, verify that you have everything, but I know they have been out here and have done all the recent inspections, and so I can give Jake the most updated list. So, so we think it'll, it, it'll be completed on time and the contract will be ready. Closed and yeah. services delivered. Okay. Yes. We anticipate it will be. Yeah. Anything else?
able to join us tonight. So um, we're going to move to a new item on our agenda and introduce John Lazarus, our site authority representative. Thank you, Sam. So first item on my agenda is, now that the playground is completed, Energy King sent out a notice to the couple of homeowners who, uh, while the playground was uh, closed, put up outdoor swings and whatnot, and basically said, you have a certain amount of time to take them down, or uh, if you can, we'll have them taken down and charge those homeowners um, $100, and they have 30 days to do so. The next one is, we're just reporting out, we're looking at um, enabling solar installs on townhouse roofs. Um, it's a little bit complicated because we own the roof basically, but we're looking at it. Um, you have questions, sir? No. Um, so, you want to go through and then we'll ask questions at the end? How do you prefer? Um, on that one, I long had a, had a desire that there be a conversation that in lieu of putting solar on that we instead do something in cooperation with the university and look at potential grant writing to expand the existing solar farm and use that source of solar to provide the solar power that the neighborhood uh, would like to, to achieve. And I'd like that to stay on the agenda as an alternative to individual solar individual solar on the town homes, as you understand, is complicated. Uh, because at the point, especially complicated on 20-year-old roofs. So we're about to enter the part of the bell curve that says we're going to be replacing town home roofs. And as soon as we put solar on a roof, that's the one that will fail, and the owner will have to take the solar off, and the roof will get repaired and replaced and repaired, the underlay but replaced. And then the owner will have to come back and reinstall it. And that's a pretty substantial expense to that owner. If we can come up with an alternate way of offering people local solar power um, in a sensible way, and we can get grant funding to build out the infrastructure to do that, uh, because that offers the whole community the opportunity to solar potentially, we might be able to get somewhere in partnership that we can't get to individually. Sure. Um, I can certainly bring it up with our facilities folks. I, I know we we are always looking at expanding our uh, renewable energy uh, production capacity. And I can't so the, the initial reaction would be that it's kind of hard. We can't get to that way to do that. Um, yes. yep. Are you going to speak any more on the solar topic? Because I, I have a solar question as well. Yeah, please so uh, it's kind of a follow up to Sandy's point. So uh, if I were to put a solar roof on my townhome today, let's assume that could be done. Um, well, I, and then the roof has to be replaced as part of the schedule replacement in uh, five years. Will I be responsible as an owner for having that removed? Or will that be part of the, the deal? I think we have to, that's, that's, that's I, there's three issues that I can think of and that is one or something. That's what stops me right now. And I think, I think that that's a tough, Question. I think we, we want to make sure that whoever is responsible for that knows that they're taking on that obligation and, and bakes that into the budget. So, so they, uh, an owner would be taking that obligation on. Is no, that the policy? Not at all. We do not have a policy. I think what we need all to right. do is work with the, you know, okay. what happens if the installation damages the roof? What happens if we have to remove it? What happens if somebody doesn't pay their bill and they want to yeah, come okay. and take it? And how do we make sure that okay. to be determined? Yeah. I appreciate your more open, start at the beginning conversation about this because every other conversation I've had has baked into it the assumption that the owner is responsible for removing and replacing um, solar that they install on the town. That's been a kind of baked into the conversation. And I really appreciate your, your openness to at least have a conversation about John, I have one more question, if you don't mind. Um, I believe many people are using wall-mounted solar power 
for their charging their cars, especially Teslas. What is the policy on that? I'm not familiar with wall-mounted solar, so it's only on the south mm -hmm. side yeah. of the house. Then. Mm -hmm. I I'm not certain. I'd have to look into that. I've never even heard of it. I mean, you may want to look into the total policy also from a ground sublease perspective. If somebody is install, going to install. We've approved solar roof installations. For not roof, example. wall installations. I don't think I would have a problem with a wall installation for a single family home. And what about townhomes? I'd have to send me the proposal. And same I'll same, have to same issue which Sandy brought up about what a roof, right? It's no different from wall mount in a garage. I'm not familiar with wall mounted, but I'd be open to figuring it no, out. No, I'm just saying. Why are, you, why are you talking? I mean, solar has to be outside. Not necessary. Well, yeah, but the wall mount batteries can be on the wall. Oh, yes. So okay. that causes an additional. Uh, uh, oh, yeah. Okay. You're talking about storage. Not storage, production. yeah. The storage, yeah. How storage solar powers. I, I don't know. I, I don't think we've seen a property improvement request. To yeah, install we, a power wall. We have. Oh, we have. We have? have. Yeah, okay. Yes, and it goes through the, through a building permit process and goes to um, CSUCI, um, the facility services building department. Okay. And gets approved and they inspect them and they, they um, approve the installation. Okay. Uh, have they, so there's an insurance coverage for that? The point is, is that single families covered. I'm not talking about single family. family. I'm talking about townhomes. I don't have about townhomes. Okay. That's exactly what we're no homes about. have been okay. But no, are are we going to have it? Let, let me comment. We do allow the, the installation of additional outlets for electric power charging because those some of those, my understanding, um, correct me if I'm wrong. I'm not sure. Some of those may be 220, mm -hmm. and that is up to the individual owner to pay for the, the upgrade from the 110 to the 220. And that is all within, the, my understanding is that those are all within the confines of the garage and the, the um, um, you have to townhouse themselves for, um, um, and that's basically to charge electric cars. So I'm, what about the inverters between 110 to 220? You don't need an well, inverter, that's AC. They don't, they, okay. So, there's no diff, no changes in the main fuse board. Is that I mean, what I mean? Like the car is basically what a, a dryer outlet is, effectively. It's like that. So, so not an issue. So you have to, my understanding, I had a friend give me a tutorial on this, so you're getting it second hand or third hand. Um, you have the option of using 110 power, 220 power to charge your, right. your electric vehicle. Mm -hmm. Obviously, it's much faster with 220. Yes. If a townhome owner wished to use 220 charging, they would need to upgrade their electrical box. Exactly. Doing all the things that Jake has just mentioned, filing a, a permit request, paying the permit fee, getting the installation done, getting it inspected, and so, I mean, there's clearly interest in solar. That's obvious to me, and we want to figure out a way to make it work, which is what you're doing, and that's out there in everybody. There is no doubt there is an interest. The question is, um, let's think about it properly instead of going and saying, yes, you're allowed to do it. That's all I'm saying. Okay. Well, I would, let's also, have, I would also offer that there is, that the two, can be married, but they don't need to be married. You know, they, they need not to be married, you're right. right. And so it's like townhome, town, now, townhouse people can install um, um, charging stations for their cars in the townhomes. That is already being done. Now, and I know that then there are those people who have single families who have the solar that can be used to charge their vehicles. So, you know, that is, that at one extreme, because of ownership, mm -hmm. we have the example with the single families. Correct. We are looking and going because of the jurisdictions via the ground sublease. Mm -hmm. What is the site authority's responsibility for the townlands? And that's what we're. That's exactly what I'm talking about. Is yes. let's think about yeah. this in much 
much more detailed way. Where, where we, we are. Okay. Yes, thank you. Next item I have is at the May 9th site authority board meeting. The UGTM budget was approved. I think you're going to present on that. Um, budget was approved. The one thing that I wanted to bring to the uh, site authority board's attention is it's, we, we seem to have a underfunding in townhouse reserves and I made sure that they understood that. Um, the budget otherwise is, um, you know, uh, I think a reasonable one. And then the last item I have is, um, I don't know who's aware about the Early Childhood Care and Education Center. They were planning on building one on campus and the campus was granted um, $5 million for the 1920 state budget uh, to develop, to design uh, infrastructure. And there's basically two sites under consideration. I don't know if it's officially Big Rock Park, but uh, sort of on the northeast corner of campus, right as you go over to Short Bridge on the left-hand side, or where the Cardin School currently is, which is basically across the street. Mm -hmm. um, we're still very much in the discussion uh, phase, um, the education department on campus, and it's gonna also provide a lot of opportunities for our uh, sort of primary education uh, major students to play a role in that, and so we're excited to see it move forward. Well, uh, well, I assume it's tuition based of some, some type. I actually don't know the details of that. I, would back on that. I know that some of the children in the village attend the Carson School, um, and it is, I think, an opportunity again for, for cooperation between a neighborhood that has children. I, I, I know that the the goal for the center is to provide uh, child care for students um, and the community, farm workers, sort of the entire community. So it's in that we're very much going to try to bring people in. The Yukon community seems like a no-brainer to me, um, but I think it's, we're casting a net wider. Well, right, and I've read the proposal. I have a question about um, maybe your, your last um, bullet point about the um, child care. Um, so Cardin is not in any way owned or funded at all by CSUCA, right? They're privately owned? I don't know. I, 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 I know that they are not a part of the campus. Okay. But I, I actually never dug into their finances to figure out who owns them. And okay. Them. So I'm just curious. if. if the current Cardin site was not chosen for the new location of this program. Um, so we would have like two child care options on campus, basically? I mean, the, the academic affairs, the education department is really taking the lead on this. Okay. And I'm not privy to those discussions other than, I know they're excited, I know they got this five million bucks, I know they're in the sort of site consideration part. I could try to do it a little bit because we own Big Rock Park, and so there's sometimes questions about easements and whatnot and what's possible, but I'm afraid I just don't have all those. So is it your understanding that it's going away? No, it's going to place? It will, I think it'll still be hard. It's just going okay. to move. <laughs> okay, so the, the name itself will remain the same? But it's a, it's a private yeah. enterprise, so. Yeah, that's what I'm confused about. But I, but I, I think the first, I mean, we're at the step of figuring out where I think okay. if Big Rock Park was chosen, I would assume that your sort of overall line of questioning would be yeah. explored yeah. by people who are educators, yeah. you know, who have PhDs, and I do not. Yeah. Um, but uh, I don't know. Just in terms of early feedback, now let me preface this by saying I've never gone to that, the Rock Park, but there's already been a lot of uh, rumble in the neighborhood of everybody being really sad about the possibility of losing, losing Rock Park. So. Um, I don't know how much community buy-in there will be um, on, the, on the topic of location, um, but I think it would be good to at least try and bring, you know, some sort of conversation forward um, among you. I know a lot of people utilize that part, uh, particularly for taking photos. Um, so, and, you know, I, I think just hopefully we can have an open conversation about it um, through regular updates. I don't know how we would communicate those out to the community other than through the HAC um, or with an e-blast that um, Jake sends, but I've already heard literally from more than a handful of people, and 
I, I actually had to ask, I was like, what's Rock Park? Or like, you went to Rock Park, then you dropped. And I was like, oh, okay, yeah, I know how it is. Um, so it's definitely, it's definitely a, t a, a topic of conversation in the community already. I appreciate you, you sharing that with me. I will report that back, and I'll make sure to put this on my agenda most months. Who, who knew? I mean, Rock was such a big thing, but apparently it is. <laughs> it's, 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 yeah. it's, it's, as a photographer, yeah. I can tell you that, yeah. that, that that is a very interesting place mm -hmm. to take pictures because light and the rock do a dance. Mm. And what you see depends on what time of day yeah. and how the light is hitting the rock. Yeah. And I especially like it when it's a person. Well, you know more about that than I do, so thanks so much, John. You're welcome. The point is, try and engage us as they start sorting through the location. Yeah. So when you have the site authority board approve the budget, I, I did listen in on that meeting. Um, is it is it uh, implicit that they also approve, approved the level three reserve study with that? Is that part and parcel? I mean, is that study officially well, sanctioned? It, it is the basis. I, it is the basis of the reserve numbers that were in the budget that were approved. So it wouldn't be illogical to say that they did, but they certainly didn't explicitly do it. I think that's all correct. Okay, so that could be published soon, that reserve study, and, and we can consider it to be sanctioned by the site authority. Right. I, let me get back to you on that. Because it's, it's, it's an important issue. It is. If we're trying to figure out what our reserves look like, and we need a study, an updated one, to really see how well our Some other issues, John, that you've been dealing with some of us on agency and other things that the, the whole Melaru situation, I know when it comes up, you've indicated it's being worked on. Yeah. I assume that's still true. It is. Is there a timeline on when there could be a I, focused discussion on that? I, I think I'm going to have information. I, I've rolled out some information. I can. I will continue rolling out. When I get to the bottom of the list of questions that we all consolidated on, I don't have a timeline. I, I can't imagine it's months, I would imagine it's weeks or months. Um, we lose Kevin soon. <laughs> I really like Kevin I, I, As I continue to say, I really like Kevin I, 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 I assure you I am doing what I can to push the issue along. Well, let's, let's, okay. let's just take that question offline again. Maybe we don't need all the answers before we have a conversation is maybe the way it is. That we could have a conversation and then that will that will surely engender more questions. So if we had a preliminary meeting on the subject uh, now and then delved all the rest of the way. Everything we have done over the last year on this subject, every answer we've gotten has created another question. So doing an interim meeting might facilitate us getting to the end of the questions. So. Thank you. I agree. Thank you for You're coming welcome. and for doing this. Thanks for having me. Is, is, is it your intention to do this regularly? Yes. Oh, cool. Thank you very much. You're welcome. We really, I, I frankly, I appreciate, I appreciate the fact that you've been coming uh, since you were appointed, and I appreciate the fact that you're willing to take questions and have a dialogue with us. I appreciate being part of the conversation, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. to access information via the QR code on the signage near the entry entry gate. 
The QR code will also give the opportunity to take a survey, and we encourage users to at, of the playground to comment on their experiences at the playground, and answering the questions with the survey can contribute to further development of the, of the play core um, um, criteria. If you go on to play core, yes, we're on the map as, as a yellow dot, which is a play activity. activity. And so, so that's there. Just wanted to bring that to your attention. In talking with um, Kathy Wiggins, the project manager, she she wanted me to encourage people to fill out the survey because the survey also lets you know what you're using. You know, and so anybody that you talk to say, just fill it out. You know, and it doesn't take that long to do. And you can fill it out again. And they can also do it a second time. You know, it's like so, so that we can give them um, lots of that. Is that something that you'll be including in uh, kind of a we mini class? That'd be great. What was that called? Uh, to add it to a mini class. To June. You think it's kind of like a reminder. Kind of yeah, so. that'd be great. Yeah. And I have to say, if nobody's been by there um, any time of day, any day of the week, um, it was a great use of the community's funds. Everybody. Um, getting old, I feel like is really enjoying it. I am asked daily to take my daughter there, so um, <laughs> yes, I, not Did so good for me, it's office. good for her, but yes, everybody's enjoying it a lot. So thank you so much yeah. for making that happen. Thank you. The one other thing we're, we are doing is that the area where the dirt and the grass is, we're looking at what the best way to address that is. We have several options, and um, we've been talking with um, with. The site authority about it and also the about it, and how, how that's going to work out. My little tiny piece of feedback um, would be I wonder if we, we might, it seems like it's okay. I've seen the benches be filled up in there when I've been there. Um, mm -hmm. If we can get maybe a little bit of additional seating, I don't think it's, you know, like end of the world if we don't, but it would be nice. Like one more bench? Like oh. maybe one or two more benches. Yeah. Okay, because the, right now there was one inside, one outside, and yeah. the room the outside, one inside. Okay. And then um, I'm looking at, in, in conversation with uh, Mission Hills Management, mm -hmm. they would really like to have those on concrete pads that okay. are anchored, mm -hmm. so they aren't moved around yeah. and you know tear up the, the pointing place potentially, and then yeah. everybody wants to point the finger. I, I would say, so, you know, as an alternative to additional benches in there, if there was an option of having like a picnic bench, because I know a lot of people like to go down there to um, have lunch with their kids while they play. Um, I think that would actually probably be an even better option for the area because I think we have the space for it. Um, so that's another option. That's, that's a great idea. Yeah. Is food allowed inside? Uh, there's no sign that says that it's not, so I'm assuming that it is. I'm, how, I'm not sure how you regulate that. Yeah. You could try. No, no, no. Yeah. I, I'm not taking a position. I just <laughs> want to make sure we don't put in when, yeah, and especially the vendor says, like, yeah. don't have food in the rubbery stuff. It's bad. Yeah, no, I don't think there's any signage that indicates that you okay. can't eat in there. Okay. I see lots of stuff. Let me double check. Let me double check. Yeah. So, I'll check so with the, the rubbery stuff is important for safety. Right. It's also got a list of rules. Oh, okay. Probably taller than I am. Mm -hmm. um, especially the shorter side. <laughs> But it's okay. it, but there's warranties involved and things like that. So right, right. So, okay. So we we'll just yeah. I would, I would encourage putting the table on the cushy stuff. That right. it would be over in the corner. Yeah, yeah. Over, over in the corner. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That way. Yeah. And you wouldn't want the kid taking the juice right. box on the. Right. Well, and I, I have to say, I think that that would actually alleviate some of that because I have seen snacking and drinking while the kids are walking around playing, and I think if we had a designated place for it, it might kind of. You know, keep, keep it in one area. Because right. okay. yeah. 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 as we all know, the rubbery stuff is yeah. essential and very expensive. Yes. Um, as uh, Brett, you mentioned, we'll have the um, brush plans completed by the um, first of June. Next item was wanted to report that as a result of the landscape uh, maintenance RFP, um, right, the landscape service contract will be terminated as of June 30th. 
in consultation with site authority and AJC's landscape committee and Mission Hills Management is working with Gothic Landscape Maintenance Division on developing a contract which outlines the expectations of the landscaping in University Glen clearly. The contract will also include documentation of services rendered. Consequences for not meeting the stated expectations will include consequences if an agreement upon time, if, a, if an agreed upon time frame is not met. We anticipate um, representatives from Gothic, Gothic Landscape will attend the June 16th. And um, has, I'm assuming, right, it's already been, yes, okay, yeah. We, I told them before I told Gothic. And, it, and to let you know, there were, it, it, there were um, six, initially seven, six um, firms that responded to the RFP, and immediately there were two that were attended to so then we continued the conversation with four, and of those, um, when it was a combination of the, um, of, the <coughs> of the money part of it, as well as it would seem their understanding of the project, our nature of our irrigation, and um, so I was really pleased that um, Gothic kind of stepped up and um, seem to understand, and I'm, I'm confident that they will be able to um, continue where we left off with the, with the right here. Yeah, just from looking at their initial website, it looks like they're based in California, Nevada, and Arizona, so clearly they have a right. really good understanding of right. drought-resistant landscapes. Yeah, that's, they are, that's great. They're, they're a family-owned company. One of the, I think it may be, I don't want to say the largest, but they, they say they're the largest family home only company, which means they don't have stockholders, so to right. speak, or board of directors, and that they are the Santa Clarita. Yeah. That's their home office. Chick, it's, it's typical when you have a switch over of vendors, whether it's landscaping or, or whatever, mm -hmm. management companies, uh, uh, there's a transition period between the two vendors. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes there's a, se a separate contract written for the outgoing vendor to continue to support for a month uh, and do a handshake. Have we got that sorted out, whether it's a... How, how this is, in my mind, how this is working, is that um, part, of, part of what Sky Godfrey um, responded to in saying, you know, with the plants replacement and outstanding work orders, they have those, and, I, and my expectation is they will have that completed by the end of June. And, okay, now the other thing that I would also offer, okay, is that Gothic has, at least two people who are very familiar with University right. Glen. And one of them is a former employee of Brightview, who was their regional manager, who is who will be our branch manager. And then the, it happens that the individual who was, who did the um, the town side or the town side um, um, phase one landscape refurbishing will be our. Um, Team leader. So we, we met, they know the irrigation, they know the plants that we have put in. So to answer your question, that you're comfortable. I'm. Yeah. The irrigation is one that's typically a bit complicated because you need to know what the controllers are, how they're set, software, all that kind of good, good stuff has to be handed over. Last and I walked it for you. Okay. Yep. All right. Just want to make sure. Yeah. Thank you. This. Yeah. That was that played. A, a role in the history. Yeah. Okay. So the next, we talked some about the budget. Right now, the budget um, was approved, and we will put a letter together and supporting information and mail it out the first week of June, so that um, we, we would anticipate a more um, detailed conversation about the budget at the June sixteenth meeting, HAC meeting, and so um, people will have received the. The, our annual letter and supporting information so that people, if they have questions, they can come. And um, in the conversation, I think everybody in the bag um, agrees that we, and um, John Lazarus mentioned it too, we're very aware of the concern about the, the shortfall for the townhouse reserves. And there are several uh, possible solutions. And the next year is really um, what we're, we're looking at how we're going to. And so um, that um, 
want, want to give the assurance. And there are some, there are various ways that it seem um, to be, um, how, how would you say it, to be fiscally responsible and not make it so that people can't live here. Yeah. Okay. Will the uh, research study be available then at the same time as the budget? Yeah, it, it, it is now. I mean, it, it'll be, it, it can be ready. The next item is that um, the, the candidates, we, we have three positions for the um, HAC coming up. And um, at the present time, I have one person who signed up. And I've, I've been talking to several people. And um, I would hope that we can talk to people and invite them to um, fill the position. I think tonight's meeting, um, I don't, don't quite know what to make of it when there are you know, three residents and three people from the HAC. And it seems like, unfortunately, when it's this way, it runs very easily and everything gets answered and everybody seems to be very cordial. And so um, I don't know how we communicate that. I've talked to various people, and there are many people that are interested in, in helping with various committees. And I acknowledge that there, there are lots of people with families that would love to participate more, that have soccer, and have you know, commitments with families that, as you know, are very, um, are, are time consuming in a, in a good way. And, and at the same time, there are many people that are, um, do not have folks at home anymore, kids at home that are either traveling and have you know various um, interests and so we continue to ask them and it would be really really wonderful if um, those that are here could could talk to people because right now we have tomorrow at five o'clock is kind of the deadline and so it's like um, if there's one person um, i'm not sure i'll have to get with john and you know figure out what we're going to do but um, if anybody has any questions or people want to call and talk to me, I'd be happy to uh, entertain any uh, conversation. I'm sorry, have we ever discussed whether um, apartment dwellers could run for HAC? Would they have to be a homeowner here in the West? My impression is that this, this is pretty much homeowners. Okay. And, and where that comes was initially, you know, when we first started five years ago, mm -hmm. I know that the asset manager attended the HAC meeting, okay. you know, that I think my impression is that uh, Kennedy was on multifamily and J ENS Rain would consider that they would, they would be the representatives for the rentals okay. on the HAC if that would be the case. And then maybe, maybe, maybe we need to talk about that, you know, and so. Because I, I, I think especially when we're in a, a situation where there is, you know, shared expenses, I mean, it makes sense for the people that are renters to have some say in. Do you think the renters would, do you know any renters that would? Um, uh, I know one money? that comes to mind who I think might be interested, um, but I think, you know, just putting it out there. I also think, you know, like when we did the postcard thing, um, for, I think, for something. The town hall. Yes, for the town hall. Okay. Um, or maybe putting, I don't know if you've already put flyers on the mailboxes mm -hmm. to kind of solicit interest. Um, I know you put it in the e-blast. Um, I'm just trying to think of other avenues or outlets that we could use to kind of um, advertise. Um, I think, you know, I'll be, I'll be frank, I think a lot of these meetings have been contentious and I think that people are probably not, you know, um, really, you know, it's, it's not something that looks fun to be a part of, right? Um, and I don't really know how to damage control that. Um, so I, I think it's, you know, kind of just a, uh, and I, I kind of spoke to this at the last HAC meeting that I was at here, you know, there's, there's a lot of contention and um, it's very, uh, somewhat of a lack of, you know, really feeling like there's teamwork between the community and the HAC and I don't know how we turn that around. Um, at this point, but I think if we could find a way to do that, I think there would be a renewed interest in serving the community in this capacity. But I think 
I would start by, you know, at least making some sort of flyer um, for the mailboxes. Hopefully mm -hmm. that would, I mean, I know we're kind of late in the game if we're trying to get our buy-in by tomorrow, but. Well, there's a second round, though. <coughs> okay. Let's, let's kind of worst case scenario it. Yeah. If, um, if we only have one person who has put their name forward, and if that person is going to be elected, yeah. Um, we would then have two vacancies, mm -hmm. um, and it would be our responsibility as an HSC, the continuing members and the person who would be elected, mm -hmm. to fill those two vacancies. Okay. And at the point in time that we solicited um, people interested in applying for those vacancies, mm -hmm. we could certainly build a flyer and put it out and say, the HAC at their June meeting is going to be attempting to fill these two vacancies. Okay. Please indicate your interest and ask that the same statement of personal interest that we ask of candidates be done. I guess I don't see it being worth anyone's time to do a candidate's forum if we only have one candidate. But I do see building a much broader application process for the vacancies as kind of the second second attempt mm -hmm. to go after this. I know lots of us have personally talked to people mm -hmm. and gotten the same response, right. which is um, I really don't want to be involved mm -hmm. in, in I don't feel it's the best use of my time. Right. So those um, kinds of answers seem to come. This is kind of peripherally mm -hmm. related, but I'm just thinking about, I was actually thinking about what you were saying about the QR code on, at the park. And I wonder if we try to shift some of our communication with the community to a QR code that we could put on, again, on, we could just have a standing QR code that goes on the outside of the mailboxes and Whenever anybody walks by, they can flash the QR code and see what's going on in the Glen. This could be one of the things that one of the topics that we could use. It could be all of the e-blast information on there. So I know it's it's not completely totally related, but a lot of people are really into the QR codes these days, you know. Okay. So I think it might. And you'll teach us old folks. Oh my gosh! It's, if I can do it, anybody can. Yeah, did, did, did this week, <coughs> the QR code for social events for a while. Yeah. How well did that do? Did anyone I don't know. You'd have to ask Maisha. I think it did pretty well, yeah. though. I think she got a lot of views for that last newsletter, which included a QR code. Um, you know, people want what they is is convenient, and and the phone is convenient, and a QR code. I mean, it's literally. I cannot tell you. You I, go like this, and you flash to the QR code, and sure. it says Safari at the top, and it opens up the directory. I mean, that's all you do. Well, most restaurants are. Uh, you know, I'm not saying we discontinue the e-blast, but I'm saying there's a lot of people that don't read the e-blast that will definitely yeah, flash a QR code. I really like the idea. Yeah. And I would really like instruction and how to use it. Yeah, it's super yeah, easy. Are you sure you should say most I, If I had the energy, I, if, if everybody was like this, I would. I, I can train you in one minute. Um, <laughs> can, I, can I ask, uh, so this uh, date tomorrow, the, the delegate, yeah. that's self-imposed, right? Yeah, basically it comes down to that we need to have, we, we, have we, to we, we need to have the votes. We, we need, in the past, we have sent out mailing with the ballots for the ballot. We need it returned by the 15th of June. Okay. So because the agency. Yeah, so that's the system. hard stop we have, is but the before, 15th of June. But before, before I, we do that, I, we I, also I, need to have a candidate's form. But guess what? If we used a QR code for the ballots, we could do it very last minute. Can you do that? Yeah, because what you would do is you create the QR code. They'd go into the page. They would have their uh, they could cam they would have their cam number, and the they could, the list of candidates is there. They push a button on one or two, however many, however many they want to vote for. I think it's however many seats are open, right? <laughs> and the the results are automatically tallied, and you don't even have to count so, because they're automatic. But we but we have to have them. I mean, there's something I'm not, I'm, no, I'm not. I'm not saying that we don't. I'm just yes. We could. We, what I'm saying is, how do we garner more community? Absolutely. Yeah. The turnout. I don't think we should discontinue 
the paper ballots. Yeah, well, we kind of have to. Yeah. Yeah. yeah you, you kind of have to live yeah. in one world or the yeah. other. Yeah. Well, last year's, you know, last year's turnout was good. Was yeah, but if it's CAM member based, it's much compared to. But you don't have CAM members because oh, no, no, because that's not it. I don't use CAM based. We we send them out, but the CAM member does not have okay. any, any CAM member on it. So okay. So so what you end up with is something where the anonymity of the voter okay. is no longer protected. Is uh, do we feel like that's um, really important to the community? Well, the, to be other honest? Thing, the other thing is is that we need to make sure that each each residence has one vote. That's what, that's why I'm saying I don't know maybe you attach it to like their address then so each but then then we yeah yeah then you only have one vote for house per household not. I'll think on it um, tomorrow when well, or this you, weekend well, I, when, you, you when I'm not exhausted. Uh, all I'm trying to say is tomorrow doesn't necessarily have to be a no, I think we're still balancing because right now we don't need a candidate's form if there's right. one person. Right. That, 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 well, so there's some things we can, can just like not worry about. It is at 5 o'clock tomorrow. Right. Yeah, okay. But, right. but if at 5 o'clock tomorrow there are three candidates, we need a candidate's form. Okay. Yeah. yeah. But if not, we should keep well, working. And also, to be, to be honest, like how valuable are those candidates? Tom, can you forms? make a motion on this, please? Can you uh, make a motion on how you want to do it for the elections? Yeah, well, we haven't decided yet, so once we okay. decide, we can put it to vote. Um, but I don't know that the candidate forum was really valuable, at least not when, I don't remember being asked anything when well, I was. <laughs> Last year, so, last, last year, mm -hmm. um, what at Chris's suggestion, what Jason decided to do was hold a formal candidates forum right. with a formal list of questions. Okay. And I was the only candidate who took the questions and did the whole right. Work That's and right. I do that. Sorry about that. The other three no, candidates, the other three candidates, chose not to do that. Yeah. Um, I. I think because the questions that the HAC came up with, I thought were really insightful, mm -hmm. and they gave a, gave the neighborhood a chance to figure out where you were. Mm -hmm. um, I will say though, Sandy, I feel like you're kind of the exception to the rule in the community in terms of knowing um, the history of, of the community. I just don't know, I mean, I'm not opposed to it, I'm just saying I don't know how valuable it is for the majority of the candidates that come through the door because, I mean, you, you could have asked me the most simple question when I was a candidate and I would have been like, I, I have no idea, sorry. Like, I'm gonna do as good of a job as I can, but I really don't know anything yet. And, and I, I don't disagree with your <coughs> concern about the candidate's form. All I know is we had the best turnout last year than we ever had for anything. Wow. So something worked right. Okay. I don't know what. Okay. Yeah. It was great to see that kind of participation. Okay. It was. It was. Okay. So, 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 do, so do we have a consensus about how we'd like to proceed? Um, I want to think about it and then. Um, I think we check in with the chair. Yeah, we can at check at in. At 5 o'clock on Friday and have a sense of see what, see what we have. I mean, what would, what's the worst case scenario if we need to delay the elections a month? We're not allowed to. We're not allowed to. Okay, it's, I wasn't sure. We just have to have people in place by July 1st. Okay, no. all right. Because, you know, to Simhan's um, point, you know, we don't want to make decisions about how we're going to handle the elections without community input, but yet we don't have another one. I guess I guess that could be enough time if you think about it. If we um, can figure out how we want to handle this by the next HAC meeting in June, that might give us like a good 10, 12 days to get you know get community input, get approval, get the um, voting going, and get, get get. I mean, 12 days is it's, it's almost two weeks. Have ago. have a backup plan. It's a good <laughs> idea. You know, just have a backup plan. Let's see what's yeah. going on. Yeah. We'll, we'll so, check in so, on, on after Friday or okay. Monday or whatever. Okay. And and take it from there and come come up with a with a plan. Sounds good. Okay. Um, okay. Informationally, the uh, can office.
lots of these pros in the morning, right? So don't <laughs> want to come and what? try and get what? What? I know. Don't try to come and get temporary parking passes. <laughs> um, and we talked about the water. The last thing that I have is that just want to let everybody know that our my dear assistant Ivy is going back to school. So Congratulations. Congratulations. And um, she isn't quite sure which law school, but there will be a law school in the future. And so her last day is going to be, it appears to be um, July, July 29th. And so what I would like to put out there in the community is that um, there will be a halftime position open okay. for someone who is computer literate and um, enjoys working with people, good, bad, and the ugly, and um, enjoys um, basically serving the community. And it's, it, I think if you'd ask her, it's, it's it's a very, um, how do you say, flexible time-wise, mm -hmm. and um, willing to talk to, to anybody, you know, young, old, male, female, yes? How much does it pay? Um, at the present time, I think it's 22 an hour. I actually have somebody that I think... Jake, is it possible you could put together a sort of a um, roles, yeah, yeah, roles yeah. description, and yeah. that way we can put it on the website? And hours, expectations. The hours are flexible. What's the hourly requirement per week, approximately? It's 20 hours. Okay. 20 Perfect. hours is what is budgeted. And okay. what we really try to do is do four hours a day. Okay. And what we, what we have worked out is we kind of go over that I go to lunch, she's there, and then I come back and she's, she's yeah. just left. Or, you know, right. then we're covered basically from nine to five. I always go when they're gone because she's a lot easier to work with. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's, that gives you that option. So that that kind of is what I have. So um, any questions? No? Thanks for this. Is that your is that your entire report? That's my are you gonna talk about any going? No. Are you talk, are you what are you putting the budget aside, are you gonna talk about any other financial issues? No, sorry, I'm not giving any report. I don't have a report for the month. I have a couple specific questions. I think I sent it an email. So I, I noticed we have a reserve expenditure for occurrence for seventeen thousand dollars. And my question was: Was that were there extended waiting circumstances, or is that yes. what we yes. can expect? No. Mm -hmm. Okay. What having to do with the the townhouse reserves for the um, heaters? Right. Okay. Uh, this was the first one we've ever done. Yep. It was one that there were. Um, Babies involved, um, an owner who was um, going into Thursday, Friday, and then there was a long weekend. And so we got it taken care of. And when we were completed with that, we realized that it, it included uh, the air conditioner as well. So it's like, so now, because they were one unit, okay? So it was, it replaced, it replaced the heater and there was connection to the okay. air conditioner, which from right. our standpoint, we would look at what we learned, yep. was that in the future, we have a we have a, an amount that we will pay for, okay. and the owner can do it.